Hello everyone, and welcome to the Hereditary Disease Foundation's June Research Spotlight webinar. I'm Megan Donaldson, CEO of the HDF. Most of you are familiar with us already, but for those of you joining for the first time, the Hereditary Disease Foundation funds research to develop treatments and cures for Huntington's disease and other brain disorders. Today, we are thrilled to have with us Dr. Leslie Thompson of the University of California, Irvine, and Dr. Steve Finkbeiner, of the Gladstone Institutes, University of California, San Francisco. Both Leslie and Steve also serve on the Hereditary Disease Foundation's Scientific Advisory Board. Leslie has been studying Huntington's disease for most of her scientific career. Her work embodies collaboration. From traveling to Venezuela as a member of the HDF's project that led to the identification of the gene for Huntington's disease, to working with a group of investigators to establish the HD patient-derived stem cell consortium. Leslie is using stem cells to study Huntington's disease and is evaluating the use of human neural stem cells as a possible therapy for Huntington's disease. Steve's interest is understanding the mechanisms of neurodegenerative disease and developing therapies. He has studied Huntington's disease for more than 20 years and by applying his expertise in artificial intelligence, he has invented groundbreaking tools, including robotic microscopes. Steve collaborated with several philanthropists in the San Francisco Bay Area to establish the Taub Corette Center, whose work is to translate the most promising discoveries from the laboratory into therapeutics, often in partnership with drug companies. The Hereditary Disease Foundation is proud to fund a major scientific collaboration which brings Leslie's work together with Steve's to evaluate genes that may modify the age of onset of Huntington's disease. During today's presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen and Leslie and Steve will be available to answer your questions at the end. We also have the chat button available if you would like to comment on their presentation or just say hello. It is now my pleasure to introduce Leslie Thompson and Steve Finkbeiner giving a talk entitled, Beyond the HD Gene, Hunting Biological Conspirators to Find Treatments. Welcome Leslie and Steve, and thank you for joining us today. Yes, yeah, so thank you so very much for inviting us to speak. And uh, this is going to be a tag team between Steve and I on, on giving this presentation. Um, and first and foremost, I just want to thank the HDF with all my heart, um, and especially Nancy Wexler, this picture of her from Venezuela. Um, <clears throat> just personally, I, I started as a postdoc in this field in John Wadsmith's lab in my and had an HDF fellowship way back then. And then um, starting my own lab, uh, the first grant I got and really what allowed me to pursue research was a um, HDF grant to generate a uh, stem cell model of HD with David Hausman and a fly model of HD with Larry Marsh. And then that's brought us all the way here with uh, Steve and I to this, this being part of this modifier consortium and um, having some funding for that, and, and that's what we'd like to talk to you about today. So thank you so much to the HDF. So as everyone here knows, um, Huntington's disease is a devastating um, disorder. It strikes individuals in midlife typically, uh, but there is also a juvenile form of the disease. It's caused by a CAG repeat expansion in the HD gene, the repeats shown here. And that then in the protein forms a, what's called a polyglutamine repeat. So a series of amino acids that repeat over and over again. And above 40, 40 and above, um, the disease is completely penetrant or an individual will get the disease if they live long enough. Between about 35 and 40, it's, um, it varies a bit more if, if someone will get the disease, have symptoms. And <clears throat> primarily there's degeneration of nerve cells in various brain areas that are responsible for movement and thinking. It's inherited. It probably doesn't feel that rare to the families that are, that are affected. Um, and it has a 50% risk of being inherited too. So someone with the disorder who has the uh, mutation in their HD gene can have a 50-50 chance of passing it on to their offspring. <clears throat> 
As I mentioned, onset of symptoms is typically between the ages of 30 and 50, but as we're finding out, there's, there's, some, there's uh, features that and processes that go on even earlier, which is one of the reasons we're using these stem cell approaches. And it can also um, be uh, inherited in a juvenile form. So um, why are we doing this? Way back when Nancy and the Venezuela Consortium had published a paper in PNAS in 2004 showing that while the CAG repeat itself uh, would account for much of the age of onset, there's a large range of the age of onset. So for instance, somebody with about 40 repeats might be expected to get the have disease around 50 and the longer the repeat length in general, the earlier the age of onset. So this being age of onset and this being the number of repeats. So with very long repeats, there's a very young age of onset. This was actually someone who had the disease at age six. Um, but what we know now is there, there's a, a large amount of variation. And this is partially, at least partially due to the presence of other genes or modifier genes or genetic variants. So differences in a given gene that might confer uh, an individual to have the disease manifest later, so older ages or younger for the same uh, given CAG repeat. So if we could, um, could understand and identify these variants, could these be therapeutic targets? And one um, study recently that was carried out by the GEMHD consortium and, and um, uh, Jim Gisela and Marcy McDonald uh, really uh, led this is that it's the size of the CAG it's repeat itself. There, there's been the identification of this, what's called an interruption, so CAA, that can be present in this normally pure CAG repeat. And it's that length of the pure CAG repeat that will dictate whether someone gets it earlier, shown here, or can get it later. So the more of these interruptions, the later the disease. So that was one really important finding in the field recently that this, this um, perfect CAG repeat, not just the size of the polyglutamine repeat in the protein, but the, in the DNA itself is, is critical for um, determining the age of onset. Okay. Yeah, and so I also wanna just give a shout out to the HDF. Uh, they found me while I was a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, and so they were very instrumental in giving me really my first financial, independent financial support that led to me you know, entering the HD field. Uh, and that's 25 years ago and I haven't left. Uh, so I think they have um, been very strategic and tr trying to bring um, young scientists, especially. I'm not so young now, but at the time I was uh, into the field. Anyway, um, the audience may be wondering, uh, why look for other targets if we know that Huntington is the culprit? Uh, and it's true, there's a lot of effort right now in trying to develop ways to lower the Huntington uh, protein or, or gene level itself. Um, but there are a number of reasons why, uh, this, why this approach of trying to look for potential modifying genes could be really helpful. Uh, the first is we don't really know yet how well targeting Huntington will work. Uh, as you know, I think all of us were disappointed by the initial uh, results from the Roche trial. I think we are still hopeful that uh, subpopulations will be identified and that whole approach will eventually uh, work better. Uh, but you know, as I think it's prudent to diversify and avoid putting all our eggs in one basket. Uh, we wanna have a number of approaches to be sure that we have uh, treatment options uh, for Huntington. Uh, the other is that uh, Huntington itself uh, has been a difficult target for drug developers. So there are uh, certain types of proteins, receptors, enzymes, channels uh, that drug developers feel a lot more comfortable uh, developing drugs to. They have a lot more experience and success. Huntington doesn't have any of those features. And so that's why it's been necessary to take unusual approaches to try to lower its levels. Uh, and so the hope is that by identifying modifying genes, it could have a very significant effect on HD severity or progression. Uh, some of those may be actually more druggable. And so it could be more tractable. And then the last point is just that every drug, I'm sure folks are aware, has a therapeutic window in the sense that a dose that's too low is ineffective, a dose that's too high gives you lots of side effects. Uh, and so there's this window where the drug is effective and hopefully the benefits outweigh the risks. And a general feature of 
uh, therapeutics is that it's usually the case that side effects don't overlap between different drugs. Uh, and so it's possible sometimes to combine drugs and get all the beneficial uh, efficacy effect uh, without getting the additive effects on side effects. So in down the road, if uh, some of these drugs for Huntington's work, but they don't work completely, uh, there, this would open up the option of a combination therapy that might make things more effective. Yeah, and then the other point is some people may be familiar in the audience with this concept of precision medicine. And it's really the idea that uh, we're all different. And in some cases, a drug will work for lots of different people. But in other cases, we may need to tailor the approaches we take to uh, different people because of their genetic makeup. Some drugs may work better for some subgroups of patients than others. And so by identifying these modifying genes, it's also possible that we could begin to uh, understand the relationship between a person's genetic background, uh, the background into which Huntington is expressed, and the tailored sort of therapies that might work best for them. So um, we're going to focus on a couple different modifiers in, in this presentation, but just knowing that there's, there's a number that have been discovered more recently, and this is a slide that I borrowed from Sarah Tabrizi. And uh, this was work by the GEM Consortium in 2019. This is a collaborative group that has used what's called GWAS studies to identify differences in DNA um, in various genes that might contribute to altering the age of onset. So when somebody first shows symptoms. And what they found is um, that there's a number of different genes. And most of the vast majority of the genes they identified are involved in what's called DNA maintenance. So the keeping DNA intact and its integrity intact, uh, that there's a number of, of genes involved. So um, some of these actually will promote earlier age of onset, something like MSH3 or MLH1, these are DNA repair genes, or can promote um, later onset and contribute to stability of the CAG repeat. And one of the ones that Steve and I are going to focus on is uh, FAN1 shown here. And this was one of the major modifiers. And there's been extensive work done in the field now on this and actually on these other um, DNA repair proteins that confer an earlier age of onset um, when they're active. So mutations say in these would then um, make them, so mutations that might make them more active would, would confer an earlier age of onset, whereas uh, mutations that would make them less active would then reduce, would um, delay the age of onset, for instance. And a little bit about FAN1 itself. So uh, in the um, changes in the DNA that were identified, it delayed motor onset to up to about 1.6 years. And the way that this has now been found through a number of uh, publications in recent years is that the loss of function of this particular protein, so a mutation that causes a loss of function, will promote somatic expansion. And what is that? Uh, typically in the Huntington protein, you have a set number of polyglutamine repeats, but in somatic tissue, so including in the brain, for instance, that repeat can, so you'll inherit say 45 repeats, but that repeat can then expand in other tissues well beyond that 45. So you, you may end up at say in certain areas of the brain with a much larger repeat. And FAN1 is a protein that prevents or helps to prevent that from happening. Uh, so when you mutate that, you tend to get these repeat expansions in the somatic um, tissue, so in something like the brain. And this is thought to contribute to disease pathogenesis, disease progression. So FAN1 has a double function. It not only stabilizes the CAG repeat, so it doesn't expand um, further, but it also has a negative effect on one of these, um, remember up here, one of these negative regulators, so it blocks um, the MLH1 activity. So it has this yin-yang ap approach on helping to prevent these repeat expansions from occurring. And this just shows an example when you in a mouse where you have 
a reduced fan one activity. You can see this little blip over here on the side where this repeat has significantly expanded in that particular tissue. So this is a, it's turned out to be a very important modifier uh, gene for us. So Steve. Yeah, so uh, the other gene that we focused on is a gene called ALFI. Uh, unfortunately, biologists choose names that are sometimes don't make a lot of sense, but WDFY3 uh, is another name for the gene. Um, and the thing you have to know uh, about cells is that uh, they have ways to make proteins, but they also importantly have ways to degrade and get rid of proteins. And they have especially uh, elegant systems for identifying proteins that have been misfolded and that need to be degraded. And one of the features of the polyglutamine expansion in Huntington is that it makes Huntington prone to misfold and to aggregate. And so uh, there are two major pathways in cells to do this. One works a lot like a garbage disposal. It just grinds uh, things up and into little bits and then uh, enables the cell to kind of flush it out. The other is sort of like a pooper scooper, uh, and that's kind of what the autophagy pathway is. Um, it really sort of engulfs the stuff that you want to get rid of. And you have a little diagram here in the lower left-hand corner that Leslie's pointing out. It starts out with that misfolded protein on the left. You could imagine that was Huntington, for example. The cell identifies it as a bad thing and puts this tag on it called ubiquitin. And then it has this really elegant machinery to connect that ubiquitin tag to a structure called um, the autophagophore, and that's where alpha gets involved. So alpha is this really important protein that's involved with recognizing the garbage and helping it get packaged into uh, the autophagophore that ultimately fuses with a structure in the cell called the lysosome. Uh, and that's uh, basically where the degradation takes place. And so, uh, the, it came, um, Alfi came to everyone's attention kind of two ways. I, uh, I Yamamoto did a really elegant screen that uh, led to its identification as a protein that's involved in a process like this for clearing aggregated protein, um, but also really uh, wonderful work from Nancy Wexler and David Hausman studying patients' DNA from the Venezuela study also uh, implicated it as a potential genetic modifier of the onset of symptoms in Huntington's disease. So those two things together really uh, got us interested in this protein, especially given uh, the role we know it plays in, um, uh, in disease. And so uh, people have now been probing it experimentally. We'll tell you a little bit about what we uh, are doing in this HDF supported project, uh, but Others have already shown that ALFI is required to clear mutant Huntington in mice, and removing ALFI accelerates that aggregation process, probably inducing neuronal stress and pathogenesis. So um, you may be, some, some folks in the audience may think, okay, wonderful. Uh, the genetic studies have proven that Huntington isn't the only gene we need to think about when we think about Huntington's disease. We need to think about the context because there are other genes that can have a huge effect on the severity, onset, and progression of Huntington's disease. But still, you may wonder, okay, that's wonderful knowledge, uh, but what good is it? Um, how do we actually take these insights from genetics and actually show directly that they are modifying uh, Huntington's disease or mechanisms of Huntington's disease? And importantly, uh, can they teach us anything about how Huntington's disease unfolds? And is there a way that we can use that knowledge to find new treatments, importantly? So this is a movie that a colleague of mine, Bruce Conklin, made at the Gladstone to explain induced pluripotent stem cells. Those little balls are meant to in, uh, represent cells. They start out as this pluripotent state and they become differentiated cells. Shin Yamanaka showed that you could put several genes into fully differentiated cells and actually essentially roll them back up the hill to form a stem cell. Uh, Shinya is a colleague of mine here at Gladstone. He did his postdoc at Gladstone and he has a lab here and he won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for this discovery. This is super exciting uh, for neuroscientists because the brain is otherwise really inaccessible. And so the idea that we could take cells from patients, blood cells or skin cells and turn them into stem cells uh, gives us potentially the option to create models that are derived from the patients themselves. The other really important point to keep in mind here is that um, uh, is that 
when we make these cell models, they have all the genes and all the modifiers and variation that the patient had. So again, it enables us to study Huntington in the context of that set of modifiers. And uh, what we know too, is we've compared uh, different species, human and other non-human uh, models is that there are a lot of genetic differences, especially in non-coding regions of the genome, which make up you know, over 90% of the genome. Uh, and, uh, and those variations can um, dramatically affect how easy it is to see and to be able to model the effects of the gene it is that we're trying to study. So I mentioned that these cells can be, once they uh, we take patient stem cells and turn them into stem cells, we then can use recipes to turn those stem cells back into a cell type that uh, we want to use to model. The movie on the left, again, is from a colleague of mine, Bruce Conklin at Gladstone, who took fibroblasts from a patient, turned them into a stem cell, and then he used a recipe to turn those into heart cells. And you can see these heart cells contracting. If you look carefully, you can even see a little blood vessel that's formed in this uh, culture with little blood cells pumping through it. Uh, of course, we're neuroscientists and we're interested in Huntington's disease. And the great news is that we also have recipes now to be able to make those stem cells into neurons. In fact, some of the very same types of neurons that are most affected in Huntington's disease. So um, as part of a, a really wonderful collaboration and consortium that was formed uh, back in 2009, uh, this was um, a group of individuals and included uh, myself and Steve, and then Clive Svensson, shown here, and Jim Gasella, Marcy McDonald, and Christopher Ross um, at Johns Hopkins. So we all decided to, we were all starting to generate these IPS lines and realized that if we could, you know, come together, we could generate a lot of them from different patients. And we could use our different labs expertise to characterize the cells and see one of the first questions being, do they have phenotypes? We had no idea whether if we um, guided these IPS cells to a neuron, for instance, would they show any of the features of Huntington's disease, any of the processes that go wrong? And so we generated about 79 lines. They're all publicly available through the I9DS um, repository. Uh, the Gladstone samples also have whole genome sequence data available, and, and other lines also um, are having either GWAS or, or um, whole genome sequencing done. They represent expansions from anywhere from 42 repeats, so the very um, sort of lower end of the adult onset range, to 180 repeats. Uh, and wild type, we have control lines as well that have a range of 17 to 33 repeats. We um, designed NIH consents that you could allow then either academic use or commercial use. So this has been a really powerful uh, way for various companies to also utilize these lines and do screens. And um, in many cases, I think Steve has, has a number of collaborations with some of these companies to help them as they're screening uh, for drugs that might be effective. And there's a new control line at Gladstone that has reduction of the CAG uh, stretch or CRISPR using CRISPR machinery. Um, and there's other what are called isogenic lines like this, where you use a single patient line and you can um, put in different numbers of repeats. And that's becoming very powerful because there is patient-patient variability and then therefore there's variability across the different IPS lines that we have to take into account as we go along. There's a number of optimized protocols. So um, immediately once these IPS lines are established is how do you turn uh, IPS line into a neuron? How do you make it look more like a medium spiny neuron, which is the, the type of cell in the striatum that's most profoundly affected in the disease? There's been a lot of different protocols developed. And as we've gone along, they've become more and more refined where you can get pure neuronal populations and have characteristics of medium spiny neurons or of cortical neurons, of brain endothelial cells, of you know, astrocytes, of oligodendrocytes. So a, num a range of cell types that are in the brain that where we're becoming more and more aware are, are affected in Huntington's disease. And this just shows um, a type of uh, neuronal cell that's enriched for these medium spiny neuron um, 
characteristics. So it's been exciting to be able to do this. I don't think when we started with these, you know, mortalized cell lines way back when we ever thought we'd be able to do something like this. And what has come out surprisingly and excitingly is that they do in fact have phenotypes or symptoms of HD. So there is our transcriptional changes. So the, the DNA encodes RNA that then leads to production of various proteins that can be, and those proteins can be higher or lower than they should be in various cell types. They have changes in mitochondria. So this is the energy powerhouse of the cell. There's, there's um, dysfunction of those mitochondria. They don't produce energy quite effectively enough. Um, <clears throat> there are changes in the synapse. So the way that the cells communicate, this is a neuron cell body, and then the process, and they speak to each other through these synaptic contacts. So this will talk to another cell. And that can be, um, uh, dysregulated or sort of these synapses actually shrink in the brain. So that you see some of those same characteristics. Um, oh, I guess, sorry, this is the transcriptional regulation here showing the RNA that's made. Here you do see the somatic uh, instability and changes in DNA uh, maintenance, DNA repair dynamics. And then here is a, a picture of what's called a nuclear pore. So the, the proteins that go in and out of the nucleus here, this, this mechanism or the regulation of which proteins can go in and out becomes uh, dysfunctional in HD. And you also see this in um, these neurons. Ooh, thanks, Leslie. So one of the things we did several years ago was to invent this technology we call robotic microscopy, and you're seeing a movie. In the upper left there, it's a robotic incubator. It delivers a plate to a nest. We integrated a robotic arm. It transfers it to a microscope. There are two systems you can see. There's a third generation system in the background and a fourth in the foreground. And the microscope itself has been fully automated too. We built motors to be able to control everything. Um, but the key capability we built into these systems was um, we wrote software that enables the microscope to tell where that plate is in three-dimensional space. And that enables the microscope to put the plate on the microscope, put it back in the incubator, then bring it back out the next day, week, month, and go back to exactly the same well and even the same cell over time. And combining with that, we developed a series of biosensors that we call the physical exam of the cell. It works a lot like a physical exam when you go to the doctor's office. We have uh, a series of sensors that sort of just kind of check on general health of the cell, kind of like checking your blood pressure and things like that. And then we have a whole another series of sensors that go deeper into very specific uh, uh, cell functions to be able to interrogate them further. Um, and you can get a sense here in the uh, series of uh, micrographs um, how the microscope's able to identify and follow individual cells over time. And so it's a little bit like a clinical study, only in this case, we're enrolling neurons instead of patients, and we're following each of them over time. We're checking on them with our biosensors. Um, we're finding out whether any undergo neurodegeneration, and you can see an example of the bottom cell there eventually dies at the 120 hour mark. You can see it sort of dis degenerate. And so we can record that event. And we can use platforms like this then to be able to, first of all, tell whether we can detect a difference between Huntington's disease neurons and, uh, and uh, control neurons. And then if we can, then to also be able to put and perturb some of these modifying genes that we've been talking about to test whether those can alter the appearance of neurodegeneration by this system. As you might imagine, these systems generate a ton of data. And so we uh, end up uh, having terabytes of data that we have to process through a computer pipeline. And, uh, and so we spent a lot of time developing um, increasingly sophisticated ways to analyze these data. And the movie in the upper left there that started to play is a new biosensor we've developed called a genetically encoded death indicator that we just published last year. Uh, it's remarkably difficult actually for humans to be able to just tell from images when a neuron makes the decision that it's going to undergo neurodegeneration, at least the earliest time point. This sensor is the first uh, that we've ever discovered that gets to the earliest time point in our hands when a neuron makes that commitment. As I said, humans don't do a very good job just guessing uh, based on the shape changes the cells exhibit 
but but it would be really helpful if we could do that. Uh, and so one, one of the things that uh, we did that Megan mentioned in her introduction was to use artificial intelligence to see if we could train a deep learning network to be able to do something humans couldn't do, which is to make that same prediction based on shape changes the cell exhibits, but using information from this Jedi biosensor to be able to uh, uh, validate whatever decision was made. So that spaghetti diagram below you is meant to illustrate what a deep learning network looks like. You feed the raw data in one side, and that deep learning network works a lot like a human brain uh, in that if you show it enough examples, uh, like the examples you saw in the movie uh, above with the yellow cells on the left uh, being ones that are positive for Jedi and the ones on the right being negative, uh, we then asked whether we could train that deep learning network to make the same classification, whether the cell had committed to die or not. And what we found was that uh, remarkably, the deep learning network with just a couple hours of training was already 95% accurate. And I'm sad to say it, even after 20 years in the lab, our humans couldn't do more than 70% accurate. So this, these AI tools are very impressive. And with a few little tweaks, it got to 100%. Now, that's immediately useful to us because now we can use this tool to be able to quantify and assess the effects of modifiers. But we took it a step further. Uh, we used something called explanatory AI. That's a kind of new approach to try to see if we can uh, uh, give, a, give humans a way to see what the deep learning network is seeing and using to be able to make its superhuman classifications. This has got a fancy name to it called gradient weighted class activation mapping. Uh, but the basic idea is that it reveals the pixels in the image that the deep learning network has used to make this um, nearly 100% correct uh, classification. And it was really surprising to us. Uh, it's a little hard to see on this slide, but um, the network had discovered uh, pixels in near the sort of edges of the cells and in the processes that neurons uh, extend. Uh, that it used reliably to be able to tell which cells were alive. But then it discovered some puncta in the nucleus, little uh, bright dots in the nucleus that, frankly, we hadn't even seen uh, that end up being reliable pre predictors of which cells have made the commitment to undergo neurodegeneration. And as a separate project, we're trying to understand that better. So now the um, <clears throat> experiment that we uh, we have been talking about, trying to really use this robotic microscope, these fancy ways of analyzing when neurodegeneration occurs um, to begin to test the role of FAN1 and ALFI in our Huntington's disease models. So these are a little complicated. I apologize, I'll walk you through them. Um, we're using a line here, uh, an IPS line, HD53, that has 53 CAG repeats in it. And uh, as the Huntington's disease line uh, versus a control line, uh, CS14 and 6, that has a normal CAG repeat. And what you're looking at here are cumulative risk of death curves. Basically, what you're looking at is the microscope is measuring at each point in time uh, the risk, uh, a cumulative risk, that neurons in one basically population or another uh, have gone on to die. And so the higher the curve, the worse the survival, the greater the neurodegeneration. And you can immediately see that HD53N tends to be, the curves tend to be on the high side and the control curves tend to be on the low side. Uh, that means um, that we already have been able to develop, to, to demonstrate a highly significant difference in the ability of uh, neurons that we make from our Huntington's iPS cells uh, to, to undergo neurodegeneration compared with uh, control cells. And now if you look a little deeper, we can start to look at um, what the effect of perturbing FAN1 is. Remember what Leslie told you. She said from the human genetic data that FAN1 played an important role in somatic expansion and uh, in preventing it. And so knockdown here is making things worse um, uh, as we would have expected. Uh, that's the KD part. And we're using a tool called uh, small interfering RNA, which is a lot like the antisense oligonucleotides that were used in the Roche trial. So it's a way to be able to knock down the gene. And we see that it makes uh, things worse. Um, and like, uh, uh, um, yeah, and so you uh, can see from both these experiments, um, essentially the same result. And then uh, the next experiment was really focused on Alfie. Uh, and uh, in the similar way, uh, 
the experiment structured similarly. We have the HD53 line that we're using uh, to model Huntington's disease and our control line to compare it to. And then we're going in using uh, these uh, small interfering RNAs to be able to uh, knock down ALFI uh, or use a version that doesn't target ALFI to leave it unaffected. And again, we see that by knocking down ALFI, remember, this is the the gene or the protein that we think is important for sweeping misfolded mutant Huntington protein into uh, structures and cells that enable it to be cleared uh, and, un and similar to what we would have predicted based on what we know from what its function is and what the genetics tell us. When we knock down alpha in our Huntington's model, it makes things worse. Uh, so the, both of these things suggest uh, an answer to the question that we had raised earlier, which is once you identify potential genetic modifiers from Huntington's disease, um, can you demonstrate that they actually have an effect on a Huntington phenotype in, in both these experiments we have? So um, the other component of this modifier project that Steve and I've been working on is to then use what's called omics. So this is uh, looking at a large group of molecules in the presence and absence of uh, various modifiers in, uh, in the iPS-derived neurons. So at one point, people had asked, what is omics? I actually looked this up on Wikipedia, and the definition is field of study in biology ending in omics, which okay. is not particularly helpful. But it really is, if you think about it as a snapshot of everything that's going on in a cell, a cell at a given time that you um, go in and see if you can determine what the various um, molecules are doing in that cell. So for instance, you can look at the chromosomes and look at their epigenetics. So the marks that are on the DNA that um, assist in regulating which genes are expressed in the cells and ultimately which proteins are made. You can look at the DNA sequences themselves, what we've been talking about with uh, identifying modifiers. So you can see differences in the DNA sequence that might provide information about whether there's a given modifier a gene that, that alters age of onset. You can look at the RNA species that are provided. So these, this is, these are the RNAs that are encoded by the DNA. And this is the area of transcriptomics or RNA sequencing and see which RNAs are made, how they're regulated, are they, do they have different variations in, in their sequence themselves, where they're localized in the cell, et cetera. So you can look at that. And then ultimately the proteins that are produced. So a heart cell has a certain type set of proteins that are made, a neuron has a certain set of proteins that are made, and these are highly regulated through all these different processes. And you can even look at various molecules. So that are made that are met called metabolites. So whether you have um, ATP made, whether you have certain um, fatty acids made, a variety of molecules that are in the cell and just get a, a, a snapshot into what the state of that cell is at a given time and what kind of signature, when you look at all of these might be present that can help you understand um, HD and other diseases better. So again, um, we might take a, for instance, a group of IPS lines with varying repeat lengths and carry out um, these various omics um, assays and then put the data together to inform the bigger picture and, and the mechanisms that are in place. And just as an example, um, I, I really like this because it, it takes both the basic science end of things. So over the years, we had studied this, this uh, protein called protein, activator of act protein inhibitor of activated STAT, which regulates a process called sumylation. So there's um, proteins that can be tagged onto another protein that helps direct their function or where they go in the cell, how they're degraded. And one of these is SUMO. And SUMO is um, a modifier or tags onto the Huntington protein and PIUS1 is involved in regulating that process. So uh, we had found over the years, this work with Joan Steffen for many, many years, that sum simulation, um, depending on the stage of the disease, that it can uh, later on accumulate in the brain. Simulated Huntington simulated proteins can aberrantly accumulate. So what we had tested was whether if you reduce expression of that protein, of PIUS1, 
what happens. And what we found is that if we did this in a rapidly progressing mice, mouse, it really improved motor skills, reduced that aggregation and aberrant accumulation that Steve was um, discussing earlier. So it gets rid of more of the trash and it reduces somatic expansion in those mice. If we used it in a slower progressing mouse, a Q175 knock-in mouse, it showed rescue of transcriptional changes, in particular things that are involved in synaptic transmission, synaptic terms, DNA damage repair. And this held true also for iPS-derived neurons if we reduce PIUS-1. And it also um, restored these nuclear pore properties and helped uh, confer such that they look more like a wild type cell. So all of these processes that I mentioned earlier are um, protected or do not occur in the same way in the presence of reducing expression of pious one. And what was exciting is there was a patient here just recently this year where they found that there was a pious one variant that's associated with later onset of HD. And this particular variant shows a reduction in the simulation capacity onto Huntington and the interaction with Huntington um, with this particular uh, change in the DNA sequence, which is consistent with if you knock it down, it has a ben beneficial effect. So it's really a nice illustration of taking the basic science work and then modifier work, the genetic modifiers, and finding uh, something that, you know, as you go along might actually be a therapeutic target. And so there's ways that we can, we can do this and we're doing this with ASOs or viruses and development of drugs. So uh, just as an example of how you can build these things together when you're um, working on the modifiers. And I just have to show this picture because it's just really cool. This is work with WACHU um, up at Stanford. And this is a line that has 66 repeats, an IPS neuron line. And what you can see here are mitochondria that have these very enlarged granules. So this is the first kind of structure we've seen at a very in-depth level. where they use what's called cryo-electron tomography that is a, a microscope that can look very deeply into the cell. And you can see disruption of mitochondria and these enlarged granules in the mitochondria. And <clears throat> if you use a, a line that has had CRISPR engineering to reduce PIUS1 in that line. This is work that Charlie, Charlene Smith-Geeter in the lab has been doing uh, with WAS lab. Um, what happens is those are completely gone. They don't form when you differentiate them and the mitochondria look nice and healthy. So just as an illustration of um, an approach that also feeds into these modifier studies. So Steve? Yeah, so another example of uh, studying modifiers is work that we have underway uh, where we have been studying Huntington's families. So you heard about some of the genetics at the beginning of the talk Leslie described uh, called genome-wide association studies where basically large populations of unrelated individuals uh, are studied, their DNA compared, and variants are searched by associating a particular variant with uh, either earlier age of onset or later age of onset. In general, GWAS studies tend to discover genetic variants that have relatively small effects. Um, and so uh, we were interested in complementary approaches that might lead to the discovery of less common variants, but ones that might have a larger effect. And so uh, what we did was to look in families, and many of you will, um, uh, be aware that in a family, uh, individuals may have more or less the same CAG repeat, but some may get the disease earlier uh, and some may get it later for reasons that aren't altogether clear. And the hypothesis motivating this project is that there may be variants that run in families uh, and may segregate between mom and dad to the kids in a way that causes one individual to get the disease earlier or later, and that by studying families, you might have a, a good way to be able to discover those. And given the fact that they may have relatively large effects, they might be an especially attractive therapeutic target for Huntington's disease. So the way we structured this study was to recruit families, take a health history. I did a neurologic exam on the patients. Um, we collected uh, blood samples. I did a skin biopsy at that time to be able to generate uh, iPS cells. Nowadays, we do it from blood. 
And I also just want to uh, give a really big shout out both to the HD roster and to HDF. For those of you who aren't familiar with HD roster, this was a, a, a basically a place to bank DNA samples. And the NIH had supported it for quite a while, but then uh, started to uh, dial back its support. And the HDF uh, ended up supporting HD roster, enabling it to continue. And it absolutely was critical for the success of our study because HD roster had samples of patients who uh, from many years ago, and we could trace some of their children. So it enabled us to really be able to get multi-generational measures of Huntington's disease in families. Here's an example. If you haven't seen pedigrees before, they have this kind of appearance. So these are some of the example pedigrees from some of the families that were in our study. And uh, you have this kind of several tiers with circles and squares. The circles are women, the squares are men. And uh, inside the circle is a number that corresponds to the CAG repeat of the person. Uh, beneath it, you can see these letters and numbers. Uh, the important thing is AO or NO, that's age of onset or no onset, and then the number that follows it, which is the age uh, at which uh, the, either the symptoms started or the uh, sample was uh, collected if they had no symptoms. And you can even see an example in family one in the second generation, a woman who had a 42 CAG repeat at the far left uh, developed symptoms at 37. If you kind of go right and find a sister of hers had no onset, even though she had the same CAG repeat of 42, no onset uh, despite being 52 years of age. So there's an example uh, where 15 years difference, uh, exactly the same CAG repeat. And can we use information like that and then look carefully at the DNA of each person using whole genome sequence analysis and power, powerful computational approaches to discover variants that would seem to segregate with earlier or later age of onset? Well, we've done this and we've found uh, many, many things. Uh, and we're in the process now of being uh, of now testing some of the things that we've discovered. But this is just a preview uh, where we have looked for um, gene sets uh, and variants in the data that decrease the age of onset. These are obviously especially interesting uh, to us because they may um, uh, uh, give us insights into what things accelerate Huntington's disease. And if we found targets in there, those uh, might be things against which we could develop small molecule inhibitors that might actually be Huntington's treatments. And so you get a little sense here. Uh, Dr. Julia Kay uh, really led this work in, in collaboration with some of the folks in our bioinformatics core here at Gladstone. Uh, but you get an idea of some of the different biological categories into which these uh, um, uh, genes fit. And then, um, so let me just uh, summarize kind of some of the things that we talked about today. Thanks, first of all, for coming and for your attention. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for some of the questions. Please just encourage folks to throw questions in the Q&A box. We'll try to tackle them. Um, but I think the important points from today's talk are that Huntington's patients with essentially the same Huntington mutation defined as CAG repeat length can have very different disease courses, different ages of onset, different severity, uh, different... Um, progression rates, and that's especially true for the length of CAG repeats that are the most common in Huntington's in the 40 to 50 range. Um, although a mutation in the Huntington gene causes Huntington's, hopefully what we've shown you both from genetic studies and from some of our own work, uh, that other genes significantly modify the disease and likely affect all those features that I just described. Um, the premise of our project that's supported by HDF and uh, work uh, uh, that's supported by NIH and others that we're doing is that if the modifying genes could be discovered that are, imp uh, that are impacting Huntington's disease, they may lead to the discovery of uh, both deeper knowledge of how Huntington's disease occurs, but importantly, good targets to pursue to treat Huntington's disease. You heard a little bit about uh, a specific project that HDF has been supporting uh, that's really trying to go from the genetic result and some basic science insights into demonstrating that these potential modifiers, specifically FAN1 and ALFI, can actually affect Huntington's phenotypes in human neuron models derived from patients. And we've shown you that they do. Uh, and then uh, you heard at the end here some new uh, work 
uh, unrelated to that project that's happening in Leslie's lab and my lab that are looking at some of these other modifiers, including PS1, which look really exciting and could open up other therapeutic strategies for Huntington's disease, as well as uh, potential options for new combination therapies. And, and one thing I just want to mention too is our next steps is we've been working with Ionis and using I ASOs yeah. against FAN1 and ALFI in some of our next experiments as well. So just want to acknowledge that. And thank you very much. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that that Lisa Salazar is another individual in the lab that works closely with Julia and in Steve's lab to really guide this HDF project. And thank you so very much and take any questions. Um, so let me stop sharing. Steve, if you want to start out with questions and I'll pull them up. Uh, yeah. Um, so how I'm, about, yeah, go ahead. Pick one up. Yeah, no, I, I'd, uh, I just answered one in the chat about um, personalized medicine potentially being a treatment for Huntington's disease. And uh, the answer I gave was just that um, uh, I think Definitely, uh, but uh, probably the first step will be to get a drug that works at least in some Huntington's patients. Uh, and I think once we have that, then we'll begin to understand how much variation there is in response to, for example, a, a treatment that's targeting Huntington among patients. And that'll be very useful for helping us identify differences between patients that might be relevant for developing more personalized approaches. And we can use genetics and other approaches to really begin to understand what might explain variation and then develop more personalized approaches. Um, um, I'm going to just go to Christopher Pearson's uh, question real quick. When you knock down FAN1 and HD cells, do you observe increased expansions? And how can you be sure that the effect of FAN1 levels uh, on neurodegeneration is linked to altered somatic CAG instability? And first of all, Christopher has been working extensively on FAN1 as well um, and is on the SAB as well. Uh, and that's a great question. We, we don't know in our system. We have not been looking at the repeat instability. Those were more, you know, some of the work that's been done in the field that I was discussing. So we don't know yet, but we um, are hoping from some of the, both the, the robotic microscopy that Steve showed, but then also some of the uh, omics work that we'll be doing that will have more insight if say DNA damage repair pathways are altered, for instance. Uh, Steve, what is Shelley Halpain? What is the mode of neuronal death detected by JEDI and the AI program? Is it apoptosis or something else? Yeah, thanks, Shelley. Um, so we purposely devised JEDI to be kind of agnostic to disease pathways because uh, it's been our experience that uh, if cells are determined to die, they'll do it one way or the other, and we wanted to make sure we captured all cell death. Um, but the good thing is we can, once we... Uh, have identified situations where increased death occurs, we can use conventional approaches to be able to uh, do exactly what you say, to find out whether it's apoptosis or another pathway. I will say that in general, um, apoptosis is probably the most common pathway when we have looked um, in, in our uh, systems. Thanks. Uh, another one, an anonymous, uh, is neurodegeneration a neurodevelopmental defect or due to accumulation of toxic mutant Huntington? It's probably a combination of the two. We, one of the advantages of having these iPS cells is you can detect changes very, very early during sort of quasi development. Now this is not a, it's not a developmental disease per se, but there are likely changes that happen early on that confer greater susceptibility to the presence of the mutation. So, and there is clearly accumulation of toxic mutant Huntington and a number of other things that are going on as well, so. Um, Steve, you want to answer this one? Is a goal to make ALFI into a drug that could delay age of onset? I think uh, part of these genetic modifier studies definitely have as their goal demonstrating that the specific gene like ALFI uh, is a genetic modifier. And if we can demonstrate that, then yes, you're right. It sometimes can open up possibles, possibilities that would more or less turn that into a drug target. Uh, Alfie itself may not be super druggable in the conventional sense, but there are genetic approaches that can be used to try to boost or suppress pathways, depending on how the genetic modifier works. On the other hand, um, I think another important point is that uh, by demonstrating that a modifier actually has important effects on HD phenotypes, 
it really does help teach us new things about Huntington's disease and about pathways that might be relevant. And that gives us greater confidence that maybe the whole pathway. So, you know, I mentioned that Alfie works in the context of autophagy and there's a lot of interest in autophagy as a pathway that might be relevant for Huntington's disease. So it could also be the case that Alfie helps validate that pathway, but we may find other pathway members that are easier to drug that could be the therapeutic approach. And I'll just add, there was another question from Jay that, uh, McKnight that, uh, about what type of autophagy, and I think that's being studied more fully. And there was a question also that, did you guys try overexpression of alfi to check whether it just it reduces just mutant Huntington protein and not the unmutated one? And I that has been very, very difficult to overexpress that protein. It's a big protein and it's very difficult. And I, Yamamoto is working very hard at answering that question. <laughs> So I'll let her talk about that when she has more information. Um, here's one for Steve, I think. Th a, a great presentation, thank you. Can you talk a bit about how your labs work with drug companies? Do you interact with them early on in a project so there's collaborative thinking or? So Steve has a ton of experience there. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and feel free to write me. Uh, I can send you a whole article I wrote about this very topic. Uh, and I think for us, uh, it was motivated by, as Megan mentioned, a very philanthropist who, whose family had uh, kids at risk for Huntington's disease. And I think us recognizing that it's still really challenging to move discoveries we make from the lab to the clinic. And, uh, and drug companies in that sense can be very helpful partners because they can provide a lot of expertise that doesn't uh, exist in academia and also kind of resources and the path to doing clinical trials uh, that sometimes can be hard to do uh, in academia. So we, um, yeah, we do interact widely with uh, drug companies, big and, big and small, uh, and uh, some of it's focused, um, yeah, some of it is they have a drug they think might work for Huntington's disease. Can we test it in our models? That's certainly a simple thing we can do. But oftentimes it is very collaborative. So we'll have an idea together uh, of you know, screening a certain target or, or doing something together. Um, some of the robotics you saw today in the AI is um, attractive to them because they don't have some of those things in their companies. And so working together can sometimes enable us to do things that neither group could do by themselves. And the great thing is if they get involved like that, they tend to be more invested. And so if something positive comes out of the collaboration, it's much more likely that they'll continue to push it along toward the clinic. So we see it as a really important and viable way to help uh, develop therapeutics for Huntington's. Um, another question, we'll, we'll wind this down pretty soon, but um, in your collaborative research, have you worked exclusively on HD or have Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's also been looked at or impacted? Great question, and the answer is yes. We both work on, I work on ALS as well, and, uh, and Steve works on everything, <laughs> and we work on FDD as well, um, and it, it's interesting how many commonalities there are across these disorders. I think we learn so much from each of these fields and they've really informed our work on ALS, has informed our work on HD. And likewise, I'll, I'll let Steve also answer that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what Leslie said. I think the surprise for us was the common threads. Autophagy you heard about today, absolutely a common thread that cuts across multiple neurodegenerative diseases. And I think that's good news for Huntington's disease because uh, it the, the more diseases some of these pathways touch, the easier it is to bring people in to you know and make the investments to develop therapies around them. And that's definitely the way we've used it. Yeah. And there's a question from Eris Polizo. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Are these modifiers giving you an indication that there's a central common pathway that leads to neuronal death in HD? Uh, that's a really complex question in many ways. I think there's multiple ways that you can get to neuronal death and that there's multiple pathways, but there does seem to be some convergence on things like DNA maintenance in Huntington's disease being a major contributor to um, neurodegeneration, but there's, there's many others. And I, you know, that was kind of the goal of targeting mutant Huntington in the first place with knocking it down because that is the, the one thing that starts everything. But um, it, so it's complex, but there are more and more, there's, there's some um, what are called proximal pathways or, or major influencers on neurodegeneration, I think. Steve, do you have any more 
thought? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't really have anything more to add. I think it's a great answer. Um, how to reconcile the role, this is Alice Liu, how to reconcile the role of genome integrity and in other genes in HD when the affected neurons are post-mitotic and disease onset is in adulthood? Steve, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> um, <Aren't you? laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I understand it, to be honest. Um, so I think uh, just the, maybe what you're alluding to is that, that there's this effect on genome integrity DNA maintenance that's in a post-mitotic neuron, but you don't see disease till later in adulthood. And I, I think that the key is that there's a lot of things happening over time, and maybe some of these defects in DNA handling are increasing over time, but you don't see the outcome until uh, and there's an interaction with the length of the CAG repeat as well. And all those things coming together will sort of dictate when an individual um, shows symptoms. And also other things, autophagy pathways are, are going down as you age. There's just all sorts of things coming at you that confer what susceptibility to when you, you would then show symptoms. So I don't know if that answers it, but that's how I'm interpreting yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, so I guess the, I mean, the post-mitotic thing, um, the one thing to keep in mind is that DNA damage can occur in post-mitotic cells. Uh, there's even been a common idea that yeah. striatal neurons might be like a particular target because they get glutamatergic input and dopaminergic input that might put them at a special risk. Um, and so, but the other thing too, is that there are even uh, ideas out there now that when we just during formation of learning and memory, we may actually introduce double strand breaks into our DNA that then get repaired uh, very rapidly. So uh, I think exactly, you know, trying to really understand the DNA repair process in post mitotic neurons, I think we're still kind of at an early stage in terms of, um, you know, what role it plays and how that all works. And I'll just add too, um, so, uh, this idea of somatic expansion, which is kind of embedded in uh, the DNA repair idea that we talked about with Huntington's disease. Um, there's been some recent work by Chris Walsh in uh, Alzheimer's as well, showing very significant uh, somatic uh, mutations uh, that can accumulate in the brain as well. So I think there is pretty good evidence that DNA damage can occur. And as far as you know, um, developing symptoms as an adult, I think um, the other thing that I'm just really impressed with in terms of the brain uh, and biology generally is how many coping mechanisms that our body has. And, uh, and in fact, I think um, in some ways that the late onset of symptoms is a testament to the fact that our body is able to develop coping responses that can keep things under wraps for a long period of time. And it's really, you know, I think symptoms, instead of being uh, the way they're commonly thought of as like when disease begins, I think oftentimes it's probably more true to think about them as when the last coping mechanism fails. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and just a comment that there's, a, you know, there's many labs that are studying this area of DNA damage repair and, and the impact um, uh, in HD, you know, William Yang's group, Christopher Pearson's group, Partha Sarkar's group. So there's a number of labs that also work very closely with HDF that are, that are studying the complexes that form and exactly how this happens in a post-mitotic neuron. Uh, so another, um, I think we'll take two more questions. Joshua Myers, with the talk about pathways that seem to tie into the news of a nexon having success with their small molecule, does that seem to be the answer more than targeting the protein itself? Um, yeah, that is exciting news. And uh, I, I think it has, like, as we were mentioning, there's maybe combination effects that, that are combination therapies. This particular drug has a, has a significant, a demonstrable effect, but a small effect in in um, delaying progression and having uh, an effect actually on, I, it's one of the first I've seen where it really does have an effect on delaying progression of the disease. And these are the kinds of things that may be great for combination therapies as well. Um, maybe one other question. Um, uh, anonymous attendee, are you studying cell healthiness in HD with high CAG or with low CAG as well? I thought it was challenging to find relevant phenotypes with low CAG HD cells. Uh, Steve, you want to take that and I can add to it? Yeah, well, for sure. Um, you make a good point that a lot of times uh, scientists choose really extreme 
uh, examples because it just makes the science easier. We can see oftentimes things more dramatically and with fewer independent uh, examples. But the um, line I showed you even today was a 53 repeat, which is relatively low. And we've been able to see um, phenotypes with uh, IPS lines in the 40 to 50 range. I think I didn't really highlight it, but one of the advantages of robotic microscopy and being able to do repeated measures on the same cells is that it really helps a lot in terms of sensitivity and signal to noise because a lot of um, the variation in science is cell to cell and well to well variation. So following the same individuals over time really removes that source of variation. And what we found is basically increases our sensitivity by a hundred to a thousand fold. So it could be the case that the phenotypes are there. It's just that you really need fairly sensitive approaches to be able to reveal them. And, and just to add to that, also is what we're finding using these kind of omics approaches also is that there are some distinct differences when you're looking at an adult onset line so these lower repeats and you're looking at the very highly expanded lines that that um, cause juvenile onset Huntington's disease we're seeing some some differences some real differences between those two populations using some of these more sensitive techniques so perhaps we'll be able to understand more about it it may not just be sort of this graded effect with increasing cag repeats so we're learning more about that and megan i don't know if you want to take this away but thank you all so much for joining us we really appreciate it and we can answer uh feel free to email us or we can answer more of the questions and send those out later Steve and Leslie, what an incredible presentation. Thank you both so much. So just um, a few, I, I learned so much from um, hearing you both talk. I'm just really impressed with everything you talked about, Leslie, with respect, with respect to the IPSC um, cells. And Steve, certainly all your work with uh, using machine learning and robotic uh, microscopy microscopy to continue um, the research and, and moving it along. And, and finally, all of the collaborations that you've established, not only between yourselves and the people in your labs, but with the IPSC consortium and with all the other people in labs um, around the world and with the pharmaceutical companies, um, you really, we are so fortunate as a community to have both of you and your colleagues working on Huntington's disease and other diseases as we uh, learned today, but we're really grateful to you for this fantastic presentation. I, I know we could probably stay here for another 45 minutes answering questions, but everyone, please, we will, we will gather up your questions and we will send them on to Steve and Leslie and they will answer them for you. And Leslie, I want to give um, a thanks to Novartis for sponsoring this webinar. Thank you very much, Novartis. And thank you, Steve and Leslie, for just an incredibly um, incredible presentation. It was fantastic. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. Take care.